Good evening, everyone, and happy Hanukkah. Um, you can see on the very opening of this presentation, a Hanukkah, a Hanukkah lamp with Judith in the center. How do we know that it's Judith? And we'll see this again and again, because she's holding a head in one hand and a sword in the other. And Judith is virtually the only female figure to be found on Jewish ritual objects. And when we find her, we almost always see her with a head in one hand and a sword in the other. Of course, her outstanding deed was <clears throat> saving her people by killing an, the enemy commander Holofernes. Judith does this in a very intimate setting when Holofernes is about to seduce her. And this scene has attracted many, many painters because of its combination of death, sex, and a very religious biblical figure. What I'd like to do in, <clears throat> in the course of this hour is first of all, to look carefully at the apocryphal book of Judith and look at the personality of Judith as it is found in this book. Next, to talk about Judith's unexpected association with the holiday of Hanukkah. And finally, to see how Judith was presented in <clears throat> later tales and liturgical poems, Putim, um, how Judith is presented in these later Jewish texts in a different way, but can a different way from the way she's presented in the book of Judith. Before we turn to the book of Judith, I would like very briefly to look at three famous paintings to see three different ways in which Judith can be presented. This beautiful, in my opinion, painting is by Botticelli. And we see that Judith is holding a sword in one hand, not an uplifted sword, but a sword in one hand, an olive branch in the other. She looks very gentle, very calm, very serene. Her maid who's falling behind her is carrying, is carrying Holofernes's head and the maid is young and slightly more troubled by Judith. But here we see a heroine who has done the deed and is absolutely purely relaxed. The next picture, another famous painting, <clears throat> is from 1613 by Cristofana Allori. And here we see a very different Judith. Judith, I'm not sure you can see this, but Judith is holding a sword in one hand and is holding Holofernes by his hair in the other. She looks a little cold, perhaps, not terribly affected by what she's done. She seems older. Um, she seems powerful in a way. And behind her, we find her maid, who in this case is not a young, beautiful woman similar to Judith, but is an older woman. Now, this painting is famous because, for, besides other reasons, because the painter has, in fact, painted himself. Alori has painted himself as Holo Furness, has painted his ex-mistress as Judith, and the older servant in the background is his mistress's mother. And here we see, perhaps, a more negative portrayal of Judith. And finally, the third painting I would like to look at very briefly is by Gustav Klimt. It's from 1901. This painting was actually on loan to the Israel Museum about 10 years ago. And here we see an older, more sophisticated, sultry Judith, a lustful figure. I don't know if you can see Holofernes' head here in the corner, but she is a femme fatale. We can see very clearly the themes of Eros and Thanatos of sex and death. And we can understand that she is not meant to be an altogether attractive figure. Okay, those are three relatively modern ways of portraying Judith. And now I'd like to go back to the book of Judith itself. The book of Judith is survived uh, only in Greek. We don't know if there was an earlier Hebrew version and the Greek is a translation, 
or if the book was originally written in Greek. That's a controversial topic nowadays. But it did not survive in Jewish circles. It survived in Christian circles as part of the Septuagint. It is part of the Greek Orthodox and Catholic Bible, but the Protestants put it in their Apocrypha, in the additional or supplementary text. But there is no doubt that this was a Jewish work written by Jews and for Jews. Judith herself appears only in chapter eight, chapter eight out of 16 chapters. And we begin with two figures um, who I'll return to later. We begin with Nebuchadnezzar, king of the Assyrians, and Arfaxad, sorry, king of the Medes. They go to war. Nebuchadnezzar conquers the Median king, and he then decides to send his chief general, Holofernes, on a vigorous military campaign, a campaign of conquest against a series of peoples who have not joined him in his earlier battle. Holofernes is very successful. He conquers, he plunders, he kills, he ravages fields, and all goes well for him. People are so afraid of him that they surrender. All goes well until he comes to the Israelites. And then the people of Jerusalem decide that they are not going to surrender. They are going to fight Holofernes. There is a town, a town called Bethulia, which allegedly, I'll say allegedly because no one has really managed to locate this town of Bethulia. At any rate, it allegedly controls a pass which will <clears throat> allow the Assyrian army to go to Jerusalem. So the chief aim of the Israelites is to have the people of Bethulia do everything to defend their city. They receive instructions from the high priest who is found in Jerusalem. They have to stop Holofernes so that Jerusalem and its temple will not be conquered by him. We hear of scenes of prayer and fasting and, <clears throat> and cries. And in a single sentence, there's only one sentence in the book where God actually appears as an actor. We hear time and again of prayers to God. We hear descriptions of God from Judith and from others. But there's only one half verse in the book where we are told that God <clears throat> hears and senses the distress of the Israelites as they <clears throat> face capture by Holofernes. In the next chapter, we hear of a Moabite, sorry, an Ammonite um, ally of Holofernes who tells, his name is Achior, he tells Holofernes all about the Jews. Holofernes is curious, who are the Jews? What are they like? And Achior gives us a brief survey of biblical history and then explains to, to Holofernes that if the Jews have sinned in any way, then it is very likely that God will allow them to be conquered. But if they haven't sinned, then it is uh, <clears throat> dangerous for Holofernes to attack them because God will not be, will not allow his people to be conquered. And it's interesting to hear this Deuteronomistic theology from a, from a member of the Moab community, but that is what we are told. Holofernes is so angry that he <clears throat> has his servants send Achior away. And Achior is then um, rescued by the people of Bethulia and he tells them about what is happening. Next, we hear of a siege around the springs of Bethulia. The water supply to the people of Bethulia is cut off and the people become more and more desperate. <coughs> Their leader, Uziah, finally says when they press him that if <clears throat> there is no resolution to their difficulties within five days, he will then surrender the city. It is at this point, chapter eight of the book of Judith, that we are finally are introduced to her. And here I would like us to look together <clears throat> at the opening description of Judith found in chapter eight. We see at that time, Judith heard of this. 
Judith, the daughter of Mirari, son of Ax, son of etc. I'm not going to read you all her ancestors, but we have here a list of 16 different ancestors of Judith. This is by far the longest genealogy assigned to any woman associated with the Bible. And it's also a bit of a confusing genealogy. She seems to have ancestors who do a bit of everything. There is Gideon the judge, there is Eliyahu the prophet, there is Mirari the Levite, there is Joseph. And this very lengthy genealogy is typical of the author of the book of Judith. On the one hand, it pays her great honor to list all her illustrious answers. On the other hand, we're a little suspicious. There seem to be just too many ancestors. And it is as if, it's as if the author is winking at us and saying, yes, I know I'm exaggerating, but I want you to understand just what an important figure Judith is. In the next verse, we are told that her husband was of her tribe and her family. And again, we never find biblical women identified, <clears throat> sorry, we never find biblical men identified through their <clears throat> female connections. It's always the opposite. We always find that women are identified as the wife of the daughter of <clears throat> the mother of some biblical figure. So <sighs> Judah's husband, Menashe, his chief function is to die. He dies, and that leaves Judith a widow. And we see she's a widow for three years and four months. Now, on the one hand, we associate widows with orphans and with strangers. These are vulnerable people who have to be protected. But in this case, well, I think that's part of the reason Judith is a widow. There's also um, the question of independence. She is, on the one hand, a woman who has been married, who has sexual experience. On the other hand, she has no husband to answer to. She has no male who is controlling her. And that makes her very independent. We next hear that if we go down a little lower, we'll see that she has, her husband leaves her gold and silver, slaves, flocks and fields. She's a very wealthy woman, but she has a very ascetic lifestyle. She built a tent for herself on the roof. She wears widow's weeds and sackcloth. And she also fasts, fasts all the days, except for holidays and the eve of holidays. And I think that this simple dress and fasting is not only out of mourning, it might be partly out of mourning, but also because she is a very pious and very ascetic figure. Finally, um, we see that she's beautiful in appearance. And of course, that's an important part of her story. And she has a very good reputation no one spoke an ill word of her because she feared God greatly. So we are introduced to a well-connected, wealthy, beautiful, pious widow. Now, <clears throat> Judith has heard of Uzziah's plan to surrender the city of Bethulia within five days if there is no solution to the problem. And she summons Uziah and the other two leaders of her city to her house. I would assume to her tent on her roof. And again, this is an independent um, thing to do. This is a woman summoning three men to her house and she summons them in order to criticize them harshly. She accuses them of testing God by setting an ultimatum of five days and says they have absolutely no right to behave in that way. And now I'd like to look at the next slide. Um, and after Judith reprimands, reprimands the town leaders harshly and tells them that they cannot set an ultimatum, he says, fine, good, everything you said is true. You have a true heart. Your wisdom is apparent, your intelligence, we know that your heart's intentions are good. And then he basically says, but leave us alone. Pray for us now, you're a devout woman and God will send rain and we won't have to be faint from thirst. He says, okay, we've heard you, but just go ahead and pray. And then she replies, she doesn't say excellent idea, I begin to pray. She'll say, I shall perform a deed which will be famed from generation to generation. And she tells him, she gives him an order 
stand at the gate. I'm going to go out with my maid. And within the time limit of five, time limit of five days in which you said you would save the city, you sorry, which you <clears throat> want to wait until you surrender the city, the Lord will rescue Israel by my hand. And this is a recurring motif in the book of Judith. Judith's hand. We hear time and again that wondrous things have been accomplished by the hand of a woman. And notice also the wording here. The Lord will rescue Israel by my hand. In a sense, it is Judith who is doing things, but it's also God. There, we have what is sometimes called double motivation. Judith will go out and act, but she also attributes her success and her deeds to God. And finally, um, in a very nice literary touch, she says, don't ask after my doings. I won't tell you till my deed is accomplished. And of course, this is the author playing with us and saying, I'm not telling you what her plan is. You'll have to wait and see. So Judith announces that she plans to rescue the situation. And then we have um, a description first of a lengthy prayer by Judith. We are told that she prays just at the time that they're sacrificing incense at the table at, at the temple in Jerusalem. And her prayer is interesting for several reasons. First of all, she mentions the case of Shimon, Dina, the revenge of Shimon and Levi after the rape of Dina, and the fact that they have performed what she describes as a wonderful deed, a deed which is approved by God. And this is interesting, first of all, because um, in Genesis 34, where the story first appears, it is not clear that what Shimon and Levi have done, killing all the people of Shem, is not clear that that is such a wonderful act or deed. And second of all, it's very obvious from the wording of Judah's prayer that she identifies not with Dina. Now we know that she's about to try to seduce the enemy general, and she's going to put herself in a very dangerous and frightening situation, but she does not see herself as the possible victim. She sees herself as a vengeful Shimon. Another interesting thing about her prayer is that she prays to be accomplish what she wants with the seed of my lips, with words and guile. And Judith asks outright and announces outright that she's going to accomplish what she accomplishes by means of deceit and lies. Um, this is an issue which bothers later or modern commentators and theologians a great deal. I'm not sure it should bother us, but it is definitely a part of her um, personality and part of what she does. And I'll be talking about the Vulgate translation, the Latin translation by Jerome of the Greek book of Judith a little later. But I just want us to note that when Judith says, strike him by the deceit of my lips in Greek, in Latin, she says, strike him by my gracious lips. Now, um, if we drop down to the last verse on this slide, we can see um, that her deceit and her guile includes not just words, but also the way she is dressed. Because after Judith finishes praying, she goes down from her little tent on the roof into her presumably wealthy house. And even though there's a water shortage in Bethulia, she takes a bath. We're told about her bath. We're told about her careful dressing. She wears beautiful clothes, clothes from the time of her marriage, we're told. And she also adorns with her with many, many jewels. And she then leaves the gates of the city of Bethulia and goes to the enemy camp. And everyone, I must say, everyone is struck by her beauty. The townspeople of Bethulia, when she's, after she's transformed herself into a beautiful, seductive woman, the townspeople of Bethulia can't take their eyes away from her, so we're told, as she heads towards the enemy camp. And when she arrives at the enemy camp, the Assyrian soldiers, again, are absolutely struck by her beauty. Now, um, there are some lovely, lovely passages in the book where we see Judith using her 
powers of deception and irony. And again and again, when she converses with the enemy leader Holofernes, she says one thing and he says another. She also outright lies to him, but it's even more interesting to see the way she uses very ironic language. And when she says to him, um, God will perform a conclusive deed with you and my Lord will not fail in any of his undertakings. Of course, Holofernes understands my Lord to be that he, Holofernes won't fail in any of his undertakings. But what Judith means is that God will not fail. And again, she says, God has sent me to accomplish deeds with you, which will astound the entire earth. What she means is I'm going to kill you and everyone's going to be very surprised. But what he understands is I'm going to help you even <clears throat> further in your conquest, conquest of the world. Um, there's a lovely scene in the book in chapter 12 where Ho Judith and Holofernes sit down to eat together at a meal. And um, I should have said that when Judith left Bethulia, she leaves with her maid and her maid takes a sack full of kosher food. We'll return to the food later. And so Judith comes prepared with food. And when she sits down at her meal, Holofernes wants her to use his fancy dishes and eat his <clears throat> delightful food. But she says, no, I have to keep kosher. I have to eat the food that I brought with me. And then Holofernes says, but what will happen when your food is all gone? None of your people are here in the camp. And again, she uses very ironic language and says, by your soul, my Lord, your servant won't use up what I have with me before the Lord does what he has planned by my hand. In other words, I'm sure that I have enough food to last me until God helps me take care of you. So one of the charms of the book of Judith is just seeing how quick-witted she is, how, how she's able to handle situations. And as I said, sometimes she tells outright lies, but usually she uses double-edged language in order to fool those who surround her. Now, um, Judith stays in the camp for three days and three nights. And then um, Holofernes is presented in a very interesting way. In the beginning of the book, he is this outstanding military commander who conquers everyone in his path. He's very frightening. He's very powerful. But the minute, the minute he encounters Judith, he turns into this much more effeminate, figure. We, he, when he first meets Judith, he's lying on a bed encrusted with jewels. He's wearing fancy clothing. And so Holofernes is virtually transformed in the course of the story from a frightening enemy general to a weak-willed man. He decides that after three days that he must prove his manhood and he must seduce Judith. And he inter <clears throat> invites her to an intimate party for two. Um, she, in typical fashion, says, oh, nothing would please me more. And when she comes to this drinking party, this is, she says, this is the happiest day of my life. And as we know, Holofernes drinks so much that he falls asleep. She takes a sword, cuts off his head, and then hands over the head to her maid to put it in the sack, which had originally held the food. And the two women make their way back to Judith's hometown of Bethulia. When she approaches her town, she is greeted with wonderful cheers and celebration by the people of Bethulia. And she immediately announces um, that Holofernes committed no sin with her and he didn't defile or shame her. He said, my, she says, my face seduced him, but she basically said, I haven't slept with him. He hasn't touched me. And um, she enters the city with the head of Holofernes and shows this head to Achior, who first of all faints to see his ex-ally's head, and then is so convinced by the um, wonderful deeds of Judith that he decides to convert to Judaism. And this is really the earliest instance we have of a description of the conversion of a, a non-Jew to Judaism. Judith then, who is perfectly capable of doing of do virtually anything, then gives military advice 
to the people of Bethulia. She tells them to hang Holofernes' head on the wall. She says that once the Assyrians discover that their commander is dead, they're going to run away. She suggests that the Israelites chase after him. And so it happens. The, um, the Assyrian army panics. The Israelites manage to chase them, to kill them, to plunder them. And then there's a victory celebration. And here too, in the victory celebration, we see how unique Judith is and how she takes on a role that is normally assigned to men. Because if we look at this slide, we see that all the women of Israel run together, they bless her, they have a chorus of dancers in her honor, she distributes wands, they put olive wreaths, and then she stands in front of all the people leading the women in dance and the men of Israel followed. Now here, Judith sings a victory song. And in general, the book of Judith is filled with biblical echoes, with biblical situations, with biblical characters, with hints of biblical characters. And her victory song has echoes, particularly of the Song of the Sea, but also of Deborah's song in Judges after the victory over Sisra. And usually, usually there is the warrior who is victorious. And often it is the women's role then to sing and praise the victorious warrior. We see that, for example, with David. And here Judith has both parts. She both performs the deed and also sings a victory song. And again, this is very biblical in the sense of we are told of the same events twice. First, we are actually told at length of how Judith manages to seduce Holofernes or try to seduce Holofernes and kill him. And then we hear about this deed again in song. And this is something we find in Judges 5 as opposed to Judges 4, and also something that we find um, in the Song of the Sea in Exodus 15. So the men follow the victorious Judith. Um, the book ends, the book ends when after the celebration and the victorious procession to Jerusalem, Judith returns home. And when she returns home, she resumes her quiet life. We are told that many men desire her, but she's not interested in remarrying. She lives until the ripe old age of 105. Before she dies, she arranges, this, arranges for her wealth to be passed on to her family, which is identical with her, or very close to her husband's family. She free, frees her faithful maidservant, and then she dies quietly. We are then told that the people mourn her for seven days, and the book ends, the final verse of the book is, I will find it in a minute, that basically up, there was no one who frightened the Israelites during Judah's lifetime and for many years after her death. And this is very much like <clears throat> the summary of the judges, several judges in the book of Judges, when we hear and the land was quiet for, for 40 years. So here too, we have um, a period of peace and quiet after Judith accomplishes her wonderful deed. Right, now I hope that you have noticed that so far I have said nothing which is remotely related to Hanukkah. Um, We've heard about Nebuchadnezzar, we have heard about Achior, we've heard about Holofernes. Um, there is no explicit mention of Hanukkah in the Septuagint book of Judith. Um, I should also add that the book originally survived, the book of Judith survived as part of a Christian tradition. The Christians were interested in preserving the Septuagint books, it is not found in any early Jewish source. There are no fragments of Judith from, <clears throat> from Qumran. There's not a single Dead Sea Scroll fragment. Um, we do not find Judith mentioned in Josephus, who in his biblical antiquities does use other stories from the Septuagint when he's telling of various figures. Um, we hear absolutely nothing of Judith in Jewish tradition until approximately the 10th century. 
and might be a little earlier, um, but by the 10th century, there is all of a sudden, there is an explosion of interest in Judith. And this interest expresses itself in various ways. I mentioned earlier um, the translation of the Greek Judith into Latin by Jerome. Now this translation, the Vulgate translation of Judith um, was done by Jerome in about 400. And he does several interesting things. He claims, he claims that he translated the book very quickly in a single night by the light of the lamp. He says that he used an Aramaic version of the story of Judith. And um, I'm not sure that we can believe him about that or that we can trust him about that. And at any rate, there are no one has ever found any Aramaic, ancient Aramaic version of the story of Judith. And <coughs> <coughs> sorry, and, and Jerome's translation is an adaptation to a certain extent of the Septuagint text. He changes various elements of the story, he shortens it, and he goes out of his way to make Judith a less independent and vibrant figure. He's interested in Judith as an instance of a chase woman. He's very glad that she doesn't remarry. He has a guardian angel accompany Judith when she goes <clears throat> to Holofernes' tent. So he, he um, makes Judith a less independent figure. And it's important to know what Jerome does with Judith because when we finally find mention of Judith in Jewish tradition around the year 900, perhaps a little later, um, one source is Hebrew translations, Hebrew translations of the Vulgate. And so when Judith enters, or I should say re-enters Jewish circles, what we have is not the Septuagint story, but a um, translation of Jerome's um, Latin text into Hebrew. Another way in which Judith enters Jewish tradition at about this time in the medieval times, after there has been total silence for virtually a thousand years, another way is in stories, shorter stories concerning Judith, which um, are called, not accurately, they're called the Judith Midrashim. And in these stories, we find again, a different Judith. And I'll be getting back to that in a minute. And we also find in several places that Judith is associated with Hanukkah. And again, you can see um, a different menorah. And we see Judith with her attributes, with her uplifted sword in one hand and the head of Holofernes in the other. Um, the, the Hanukkah, the menorah start to appear from the 16th century onwards, and they appear in several countries at the same time. But the stories of Judith are the um, Midrashim and the translations of the Vulgate into Hebrew are considerably earlier. Now, why does Judith become associated with Hanukkah? Or I should perhaps say, how does she become associated with Hanukkah? Well, first of all, um, we have to go back to the Septuagint text and have to look at the dramatic date of the story. When does this tale of Judith supposedly take place? And we see that the dramatic date is a very confusing one. Okay, the very opening verse of the book, which is in the 12th year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, who rolled over the Assyrians in the city of Ninveh, in the days of our Faxad, who rolled over the Medes in Ekbatana. Okay, now we know that Nebuchadnezzar ruled over the Babylonians, not over the Assyrians. And the city of Ninveh was not captured by him, it was captured by his father. And if you have never heard of the king of Midian, our Faxad, you are in very good company because he's found only here. So in the very first verse of the book of Judith, the author seems to be telling us this is not real history. This book is written in a biblical style, but what the story is, <clears throat> is what is called a paradigmatic story. Why does Nebuchadnezzar rule over the Assyrians? 
probably because the two two chief biblical kings who who the Israelites feared were a Nebuchadnezzar of, who ruled over the Babylonians and Sancheriv who ruled over the Assyrians. And what the author has done here is merge the two figures into one. And he then sets up an imaginary opponent. And actually in the days of the acts of Nebuchadnezzar, the Medes were, were allies of the Babylonians and they weren't enemies. So that's one implication of the day, which is an impossible implication. Another indication, and here um, we have a description of the Jews who have recently returned from captivity and only lately had the people come together and they've purified the vessels, the altar and the temple from pollution. And here, of course, um, we are referring to, I think it seems an obvious reference to, to the year 164 and to Judah rededicating, reconsecrating the vessels of the temple. And an, another reference further on when Achior is telling the history of the Jews to all the furnace, we hear that they have returned from the diaspora and they have occupied the Jerusalem where their temple is. So we have very different dates. If we take the Nebuchadnezzar, we're talking about 586 BCE. If we're talking about the return to Zion, we're talking about the end of the, the sixth century, the fifth century, and then we have year 164. Now, if we look through the book of Judith, there are references to Assyrians, to Babylonians, to Persian elements. And um, there are also indirect references to the time of the Maccabees, to the Hasmoneans. Um, the high priest in Jerusalem is also the military commander. The description of the Council of Elders, the Gerusia, the description is um, of the army and the way things are, are fought. All these together um, seem to point to um, Hesmonean times. And commentators nowadays are agreed that the book was definitely written against the background. Of the, of, of the events that underlie the holiday of Hanukkah. But there is no explicit mention in the original book of Judith, in the original um, Greek book that we have, there is no explicit mention of Hanukkah. I'll just add before I go to the next slide that in a late addition to the Vulgate, we hear that the victory over Holofernes in the Assyrian army is counted by the Hebrews in the number of holy days and has been observed by the Jews from that time until the present day. And people see this late edition, it's not part of the original Vulgate, as a reference to Hanukkah. Now, another reason, another reason that <clears throat> the story is associated with Hanukkah is, first of all, the description of Nebuchadnezzar, who is presented by Holofernes as a god. Holofernes cuts down foreign shrines, cuts down sacred groves, destroys all the gods, so that all the gods will worship Nebuchadnezzar alone. In other words, um, <clears throat> he wants to be worshiped as a single god. And later on, when Holofernes becomes angry at Achior's suggestion that the Jewish god will possibly, <clears throat> will possibly rescue his people, he says, who is God if not Nebuchadnezzar? Now, the king that we think of when we think of someone who presents himself as a god is, of course, Antiochus IV, the fourth. Um, and there is a general, a commander, whose head was cut off, um, not in the time of Antiochus, slightly later, a commander called Nicanor, whose head was cut off while battling with Judah, the Maccabee, and his um, head was brought to Jerusalem. And in general, there are many similarities between Judith and Judah. And of course, first of all, we can start with her name, Judith, which could mean Jewish, could mean a woman who lives in Judea, and could be a female form of Judah. And let me go to the next slide. Here we have a lovely, lovely um, manuscript, the Rothschild Miscellany from the late 15th century, 
where we see on one page, that together on the same page, we see Judith with her sword and her the head of Holy Furnace, and we see Judah the Maccabee. And we can see Maccabee is written here, and we can see that he has a huge shield with a lion. So here the two figures are physically brought together. And the sequence of the story that we find in one Maccabees of what happens to Judah, and or what he does, I should say, and the sequence of the story of Judith is virtually identical. We find a prayer to God. We find that the chief leader is killed. We find that the enemy panic and flees. We find the Israelites kill and plunder. The enemy's head is brought to Jerusalem. There's a victory celebration. There's a peaceful period, longer in the case of Ju uh, Judith, shorter in the case of Judah. And <coughs> the two figures, they're pious, they're celebrated in song, they're mourned. So one possible reason that Judith becomes associated with the holiday of Hanukkah is that the book was originally written partly against the background of what happened the <coughs> of the Hasmoneans conquests and rule. And, um, and that later caused Judith herself to be placed within the story and even to be placed within their actual family. Now, sometimes she is um, said to be a sister of Judah, sometimes she's an aunt, sometimes she's a, a, a relative. And if we look at this um, beautiful, oh, sorry. If we look at this beautiful manuscript, what happened to, oh, here we are. Um, it is actually um, an illumination. On top, we can see it says, we can see it says Yosephon, but I'm more interested on what we have over here, which is a piyut, a liturgical poem telling of, um, of Judith's deed. Okay, it is um, by Yosef ben Shlomo of Provence, who lived in the first half of the 11th century. It's called Odecha ki anaftabi. I give thanks to you, praise to you because you were angry with me and then retracted your anger. And it tells of um, the Jewish resistance to the degrees of Antiochus IV. And it has a double story. And um, in, in this dispute, which I must say is um, not written in simple Hebrew. And if any of you are interested in seeing the actual words um, and an English translation, I, you can find it in a website called Open Sidur open Sidur, and, and there you will find the, the, um, the wording. This was recited on the Shabbat of Hanukkah in, in synagogues in Italy. And it contains, as I said, a description of the decrees of Antiochus. And it also has a double story. It has a story of, we'll call her Hannah, something she's called Hannah, the daughter, um, sorry, the sister of Judah, she's a Maccabean woman, she's a Hasmonean, and, and that is followed by the story of Judith. Um, so that is one reason why Judith becomes associated with Hanukkah. Another reason might be her um, similarity to Esther. Now we know that Purim and Hanukkah are two holidays that were arranged by the rabbis, they're not found in the Torah. We have Megillat Esther, the scroll of Esther, which is read on Purim. And some of the stories of Judith are literally called Megillat Yehudit. And one of them says Megillat Yehudit Leomro Bechanukah. So it is to round out, as it were, um, we have two beautiful women who save their people, who manage to outmaneuver um, Gentile men where matters come to a head, forgive the poem, at a, um, at a drinking party. And because of the similarities between Esther and Judith, um, Judith, so Esther is associated with Purim. Esther is behind Purim, so Judith becomes associated with Hanukkah. And what I'm showing you here is a, um, <clears throat> a Birkat Mazon, a grace after meal of 1780 where we see the prayer al Hanisim, which we say both in Hanukkah and Purim. And here we see, um, I hope it's clear, we can see again Judith in the tent with Holofernes' head 
in one hand and a sword in the other. So um, I mentioned the, the um, Piut in, in recent years, someone named Gabrielle Wasserman has done a doctorate on all the Piotim, which are connected to Hanukkah and all the liturgical poems. Many of them are not available in printed form. Many of them you have to go to manuscripts. And there is um, the one Odechaki and Aftabi is a particularly well-known one, but there's several others which are very interesting. And there's one which hasn't been published, which is actually um, in beautiful Hebrew and less difficult Hebrew. It's an acrostic poem, and it's based on a Hebrew translation of the Vulgate. So we have poems which are both based on Hebrew translations of the Vul Vulgate, and also um, are very similar to um, the stories I mentioned before, the Midrashim. I'd like to um, look very quickly at um, the two part stories that we find in Midrashim. First with Hana, the <clears throat> sister of Judah, who features in the first part of the story, and then with Judith, who is found in the second. Now, um, we are at a time of degrees, decrees against the Jews, and one of them is what's called Jus Prima Inocus, the right of the first night, where when a Jewish woman is about to be married, she first spends the night with the foreign ruler. And this goes on for several years until it's the time for Judah's sister, Hannah, to get married. She objects strenuously. And here we see a beautiful, this is a 16th century manuscript from Paris. We see a beautiful illustration of what she does. She um, is gathered together with her family. And in some versions, she takes off all her clothes. In other versions, she dresses in rags. She serves them wine. And they say to her, aren't you ashamed to do what you're doing? And, and she says, you should be ashamed to send me off to a Gentile ruler. And um, she convinces her brother. They then dress her up as a bride, um, arrange a beautiful procession to the ruler. And then Ju <laughs> Judah is invited to spend time alone with this ruler and in this inner room of the ruler, he cuts off his head and then there's um, a battle. Okay, we can see clearly that there are elements of the Judith story here. We can see the fact that uh, <clears throat> wine is served, the fact that Judah is found alone with the ruler, um, that he cuts off the head, not in battle, but in, in an inner room. And the two women are, are like in that both of them um, reprimand the people their own people and they say, you are not behaving properly. This is not the way things should be done. And, um, and it's interesting. I don't have the time to go into great detail, but it's very interesting to compare the two stories. Now, in these double stories of the Hannah, the, the sister of Judah and, and Judith, Judith enters the second part um, um, because after the, the ruler is killed, then Holofernes, who now becomes the king of priests, he is the brother of the killed ruler, and then he comes to um, try to conquer Jerusalem. The story now goes to Jerusalem, and Judith again um, takes care of him. In the little time that is left me, um, first of all, I'd just like to show you another um, beautiful manuscript, which has, again, has the liturgical poem, and here we can see, and it's an interesting question whether the person who wrote out the manuscript also um, did the illustrations because they fit in so beautifully. And here we can see Judith approaching Holofernes. Here she um, uh, it kills him, and here she's returning to her city um, with his head. And again, I just wanted to do an enlargement of this because we can see that Judith is not dressed with great modesty. This is a 15th century manuscript. And again, just look at the pretty pictures. And what I'd like to end with was, is the difference between the way Judith is presented in um, the Midrashim, as opposed to the way she is presented in the original book of Judith. And in many ways, in these stories, in these medieval stories, she is very diminished. Okay, um, when Judith goes to Holofernes, 
in the Septuagint book, she tells him, she tells him that she serves God and that God will tell her, she claims that the Israelites are sinning and God will tell her when it is the right time to go and attack them in punishment for their sins. She presents herself as a prophetess of sorts. Um, and it's, a, it's an interesting, it's not exactly the truth. And it's, I think, an example of wishful thinking, but it is Judith who's going to hear um, what is to happen. And she is related, uh, she um, is going to hear this from God. Now, we have already seen that she has an extraordinarily long genealogy in the book of Judith, but in the Midrashim, and that her husband is identified through her, but in the Midrashim, it is the opposite case. She always presents herself as a daughter of the great men of Israel. Um, she says her brothers, you know, her father, they're priests or they're prophets. And when she comes to Holofernes, she knows, she tells him that he's going to conquer um, Jerusalem because he's heard, she has heard this from her, the male members of her family. So Judith has a lesser relationship with God and she is also identified as a daughter, as a sister, rather than um, as a woman in her own right. Another interesting difference, and this is extraordinary in my opinion, is that in the original book of Judith, she tells the leaders to order the city gates opened and they do that. They order the young men to open the city gates as she requested and she goes off in her mission. In the Vulgate, we find something similar. We find that she comes to the gates, Uziah and the elders are astonished at her beauty, but they don't ask her anything and they just let her go through. In Midrash after Midrash, I just brought you one as a sample, but in Midrash after Midrash, she comes, as she's going off, she comes to the gatekeepers and says, please open the gates. And they repeatedly accuse her of going over to the um, camp of Holofernes, of trying to, well, as I said, play the whore with him, to betray, to betray the city. They do not let her go until she actually really has to beg them. And what is even more astonishing, in my opinion, is when she comes back with the head of Holofernes and she shows them the head after she kills him, they don't believe her. They are not willing to let her back into the city. And in one midrash, they say, oh, you might've just found a head rolling around in the street and brought it to us. And in many of these tales, the figure of Achior is introduced in the late stage of the story and in, in, in basically what is the wrong place, strictly so that he can back up Judith and say, yes, this is the head of Holofernes. So Judith is again diminished. Her own people do not um, respect her, neither when she leaves, nor which was just even more amazing when she returns. They do not celebrate her deed. They do not praise her. Her beauty is mentioned once in a while. Her um, intelligence is not mentioned. She is a lesser figure in these stories. And here I just wanted to show you that in this piyut, um, you can see that Judith is standing at the gate with her maid. And we see that it's, this drawing is accompanying the words, Ra'uha velohe minula, okay? Ra'uhu, sorry, they saw the head and they did not believe her. Um, this is, we'll just look at this very quickly. This is an illustration from a, a Christian work, The Garden of Delights. But again, what we can see here, we see the Holofernes is put to death. Here we see carrying the head back to the city. And here we see the entrance at the gates with, um, again, there's like a break, a halting before they were allowed to return. Okay, I, um, I am running out of time, but I would like to mention um, two more things. One is that in the original book of Judith, the way she manages to escape is that she has already set up the custom of going to a spring in the enemy camp to purify herself. She does this three days in a row. And then when she finally manages to kill Holofernes, um, she escapes by pretending that she's again going to the spring. She does this to pu purify herself. In Midrash, Holofernes wants to sleep with her right away. Sometimes he asks if he can marry her. Um, that's the way he puts it. 
And she always says, um, she says something I want with all my heart. We see a little bit of her irony, but I'm in purity. I meant straighting. And I have to go to the spring to purify myself. So what in the book of Judith is an interesting ritual of purification by a religious woman and has nothing to do with Mida, has nothing to do with ministration. In the Midrashim, it becomes the act of why would a woman go to a spring to purify herself? Because she has just finished bleeding. Okay, I do not have time to discuss the many interesting echoes of biblical scenes which are found in Midrashim. Since they are in Hebrew, it is easy to quote uh, a passage in Hebrew which refers to someone like Esther or to Ehud or, or to other figures and work it into the story of Judith. And it's a very nice, subtle way of saying, yes, here we can see that Judith does resemble Esther, or here we can see that she resembles Ehud, or something very interesting that I don't have time for. She even resembles at one point in one midrash, Zlila, Delilah, and Samson. Um, Finally, I would like to talk about the mention of Judith in Halakha. And as I said, she's not found in the Mishnah, not found in the Talmud, but we do know um, that her story has circulating, uh, had circulated slightly later. Okay, we hear that women, um, sorry, that women um, light Hanukkah lights and they say, I, they were part of the, the miracle. It doesn't say that they performed the miracle, that it came bad through them. But um, when Rashi comments on the passage, we see that Rashi, and we know that Rashi knew the piyut that I've mentioned several times. We see that Rashi combines two stories. He says that he talks about <clears throat> the fact that brides had to be um, bedded first by the official and that the miracle was performed by a woman and here he seems to be referring to Judith and it is only in the time of Rashi's grandson that we hear um, the Rashbam that we hear that just as the miracle of Purim came through Esther the miracle of Hanukkah came about through Judith. So not in the Talmud itself but in later commentators, Judith is officially associated with Hanukkah. And finally, um, I don't really have time for this, but we do hear in later people who are writing about customs and writing about halakha, we hear a version in which Judith um, gives the enemy general cheese to eat. He, she gives him cheese, he becomes thirsty, he drinks too much wine, and that is why um, she's able to kill him and it then becomes a custom and it still is to this very day, I think, a custom in certain, um, in certain circles to have cheese on Hanukkah. And that, of course, is related to, I think, related to Yael, who gives the general Sisra, um, well, according to the prose version, she gives him milk and according to the poetic version, she gives him um, milk or curds. So she gives Sisra cheese or some sort of milky drink. And I think that's where Judith's cheese comes from. Okay, I will stop here. I understand that I should leave some time for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Guerra. Um, there were a few questions. Actually, some of them were. Um, uh, a few a few people asked the same questions. Um, one of which was, why was the book of Judith not put in the Tanakh uh, as opposed to Esther? Ah, okay, that's that's an excellent question, and uh, we should notice, by the way, that um, that uh, Judith, in a way, is more pious and more religious than Esther. Okay, she's very strict about eating kosher food as opposed to Esther. She does not sleep with the Gentile. She, she prays to God and mentions God all the time. God is not even found in the book of Esther. Um, and there are several suggestions, no definite answer as to why Judith did not become part of the Tanakh. One possibility is that we don't know exactly when the biblical canon was finally established, 
but it could be that the book of Jerusalem, which was composed at about 100 BCE, that it was written too late. Another possibility is that um, the book might have originally been written in Greek, and then of course it would be in the Tanakh. Another suggestion that has been made is that I said that Achio was um, the first one that we know of to convert, but his conversion process, which is very brief, does not exactly match the rabbinical rules of conversion, but those rules may have been later. I've also come across the explanation that Judith was too powerful. Um, she was too independent, that it was not a figure, um, she was not a figure who was appreciated by those who put together biblical canon. But when you have four explanations, that means that you don't really know. A little too strong headed to, uh, for the men, I'm exactly. assuming. Yeah, which again, we don't really know. Um, okay, so uh, Robert is asking why do you think the book of Judith was written about 100 BCE? Um, several reasons, partly because, as I said, um, it's not only the, the events of, of Hanukkah, but also the way the, the events are written up, which was influenced by. Um, the book of one Maccabees, it's partly, um, it has to be um, before the Roman conquest because there's no mention of the Roman conquest. Um, the descriptions of institutions of the armies of the way means of fighting. Um, also the, the way the Greek is transliterated, the Hebrew is translated into Greek. There are a whole series of reasons why um, <coughs> behind that date. Okay, um, <coughs> excuse me. And one last question. Um, did the medieval Midrashim relate to Judith killing, uh, a for, uh, sorry, and her killing of a foreign ruler to medieval Jewish circumstances in the medieval kingdoms? Sorry, I didn't understand. Could you repeat that? Did the medieval Midrashim relate to Judith and her, her killing of the foreign ruler of two, two medieval Jewish circumstances in the medieval, what? I don't understand myself. Um, I think um, I think if I understood one of the reasons that we see that Judith is more restricted, okay, and more looked down upon, does have to do with medieval ideas of the role of women, the place of women, um, etc. If that's what the question is, but I'm not sure. I, I don't understand myself. So there you go. And last last question: Was the Book of Judith written at the same time of, uh, as the Book of Maccabees? I think it came after um, one and two Maccabees. I think you can, um, at least the Greek has linguistic echoes. Um, as I said, the presentation seems influenced by it. So I would say it was a little later. Okay. Well, thank you very, very much, Professor Gira. It was fascinating. I know I myself learned quite a few uh, new things. So thank you very, very much. I invite everybody to continue joining our events in English and in Hebrew. You are more than welcome to check out our website to see what's going on. Um, thank you, happy Hanukkah, and we'll see you next Thursday. Bye-bye. Goodbye.